Welcome to the first set of videos on analysis of systems. This video looks at steady state values. First you might want to ask what do we mean by steady state and often you'll hear the terminology used asymptotic rather than steady state but in control people often use the two interchangeably even though they're probably not exactly the same. So by asymptotic value, it's the limiting value of a signal as time tends to infinity. And why is this value important? Because in a control system, you will normally want a particular signal. It could be a temperature or a pressure or a distance or velocity. You want that signal to obtain a particular value. And therefore, we want to know what is the asymptotic value of a particular property or signal. Now, an initial question you might want to ask is, what sort of signals have an asymptotic value? And we need to know that before we think about how to compute it. Here's an example of some typical signal plots. And the question you want to ask is, which of these lines or signals has an asymptotic value? Let's look at each of them in turn. So at the bottom, you'll see I've written down all of the signals. First signal, e to the naught 0.04t. And I hope it's obvious to you that that's this one here, this red one here. And it's an exponential with a positive exponent. It's diverging to infinity. Clearly, it does not have an asymptotic value. What about this one, e to the minus 0.2t? Well, that's the green signal. I'll try and overlay it here. There it is, the green one. And you'll see, yes, that's converging to zero. It does have an asymptotic value. What about sine 2t? Well, I don't need to explain that. It oscillates forever. Clearly, it does not have an asymptotic value. That's the sort of magenta curve you can see on this picture. Next, e to the 0.04t sine 2t. Now, this is an exp uh, a sinusoid multiplied by an exponential where the exponential is going off to infinity. And you'll see there's a signal here, a sinusoid, which has got growing magnitude. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So clearly this too does not have an asymptotic value. What about the next one? e to the minus 0.2t sine 2t. And that's this blue oscillating signal. You'll see it's a sinusoid but the amplitude is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So it does have an asymptotic value of zero. Last two now. 0.2t is a ramp. You can see that with these sort of uh, scion curves. Clearly, going off to infinity does not have an asymptotic value. And the last one, 0.2t e to the minus 0.2t. That's that one here with the dotted line. And you see it starts going up, but then comes back and converges to zero. So what we've done here is we've looked at some examples of different signals and you can see a few of them have asymptotic values but actually most of them do not. What's our general observation? A pure sinusoid does not have an asymptotic value. It oscillates forever. An exponential with a positive exponent does not have an asymptotic value. It goes off to infinity. Uh, Parabola and ramps and general polynomials do not have asymptotic values. They go off to infinity. So there's a class of signals that do not have asymptotic values. The only signals indeed that we found with an asymptotic values were those that were an exponential with a ne negative exponent um, on its own or perhaps multiplying something else. So there's a very small class of signals that have asymptotic values. And indeed, those signals converge to zero. There is one other class of signals we didn't have on the previous slide. And those are signals defined to be constant. So some examples here, x of t equals 1, or y of t equals 2, z of t equals minus 5. These are usually denoted as steps. This means we've now got two classes of signals with asymptotic values exponentials with negative exponents, or signals multiplied by that, or signals which are just a constant. What, therefore, is the asymptotic value? 
We've put some more signals down here for you to look at. And the question is, for each of these signals, what is the asymptotic value? I'll do each in turn. If you look at e to the minus 4t, it converges to 0. e to the minus 2t, it converges to 0. e to the minus 0.04t sine 2t, it converges to 0. e to the minus 0.2t cos t, it converges to 0. You're seeing a pattern here, I hope. Anything multiplied by this stable exponential is going to zero. The asymptotic values are rather the same and therefore easy to compute. But the last two are slightly different. 3 plus 2t times e to the minus 0.001t. Now, the bit on the right, this bit, converges to zero. So what we get left with is just 3. And if I look at this other example here, Again, the bit on the right converges to zero, so all I get left with is minus one. Can we get some conclusions from this? Most of the signals have an asymptotic value of zero, which means calculating asymptotic values is very easy indeed. Only one class of signals has a non-zero steady state, and you've seen that, it's the constants. If you want a non-zero steady state, you need a constant. Now this slide is just for completeness. Signals with non-zero asymptotic values or steady states, uh, step signals or constants are the only signals with a non-zero steady state. If you look in the books, uh, especially chemical engineering, you'll find they're often defined with this terminology here, a heavy side step function. And I'm going to do a plot so you can see what they look like. We've got an axis on the bottom here of time, and the vertical axis will put h of t. And you'll see in the definition in the box, the heavy side step function is defined as having a zero value in negative time. They are zero. Then it goes to one at time zero and stays at one thereafter. And this is why it's often called a step function, because you'll see this red curve looks a bit like a step. Now, the question we want to ask is, can we find the constant part of a signal quickly? Because that tells us what the asymptotic value will be. From here on, the videos, we're going to use Laplace representations of signals rather than time domain. Because when you're using block diagrams, you will usually uh, find the Laplace transform of a signal, if it's internal to a loop or something, and you can get that in a straightforward manner, but you won't necessarily know what the corresponding time domain representation is, and it will be non-trivial to do that, whereas the Laplace, you will get in a straightforward fashion. So what we want to do is infer the steady state from Laplace, because that's the easiest thing to do. Therefore, we need a tool. To find the implied steady state of a signal, when only the Laplace transform of that signal is known. And the tool we're going to use is called the final value theorem. Sorry, it went the wrong way there. Now, just a warning at the bottom here, and this is a very important warning. The final value theorem can only be applied if the signal has a final value. So by definition, the final value of him says, what's the final value of the underlying signal? If the underlying signal does not have a final value, then clearly the final value theorem cannot be applied. So don't try. Now, here is the final value theorem. And hopefully you'll agree it's very straightforward. It says the limit as time goes to infinity of f of t is the same as the limit as s goes to zero of s times f of s. Now we're going to use some simple examples to demonstrate this. But the reminder once again. In order to use the final value theorem, there must be a final value in the underlying signal. So the limit as t goes to infinity of f of t must exist. So clearly, you cannot apply the final value theorem to ramps or parabola or divergent exponentials or pure sinusoids and so on. Don't try. Some simple examples. So what I've got here, x of t equals e to the minus at. But remember, the final value theorem is expressed for Laplace. So I've written the Laplace of that. There it is. x of s equals 1 over s plus a. So all I'm going to do 
is plug that straight into the final value theorem. So I'm going to get the limit as s goes to 0 of s over s plus a, which is going to give me 0 over a, which is 0. Now you knew, in fact, that an e to the minus a t had a final value of 0, so you're not particularly surprised when the final value theorem says, yep, it's 0. And hopefully that gives you confidence that the theorem works. Here's another one. y of t equals 1 minus e to the minus bt, but let's assume you didn't know that, and all you were given was the transform y of s equals b of s, s plus b. So applying the final value theorem, I do the limit as s goes to 0 of b s over s, s plus b. And you'll notice now that I can cancel the s top and bottom. And then when I set s to 0, I get b over b, which is 1. And if you look back to the left, which was the original signal, you can see from the original signal the final value was indeed 1. So again, I hope you've got some confidence. The final value theorem is giving you the result you expect. Here's a final example. Z of t equals e to the minus t sine 2t. Z of s equals 2 over s plus 1 squared plus 4. So here I'll do it quickly. I'll just substitute in the final value theorem. Limit as s goes to 0 of 2s over s plus 1 squared plus 4. And now if I let s tend to 0, I'm going to get 0 over 5, which is 0. And again, you look at the original signal, z of t, and you said, yes, I knew the final value would be 0, and I'm glad the final value theorem has said the same. What we want to do next, then, is have a look at partial fractions and see if we can get some understanding of how to spot the final value very, very quickly. Here I've given you a g of s equal to 5 over s plus 1 times s squared plus s plus 4 times s plus 2. Now, if I separated this into partial fractions, here it is on the right, and you can look at the videos on partial fractions in inverse Laplace if you've forgotten this. You can write it out as a over s plus 1 plus 2b plus cs over s squared plus s plus 4 plus d over s plus 2. Now, each of these signals, I'll circle them in red, you know that one represents a convergent exponential, the final value is 0. This one here represents a sinusoid multiplied by an exponential, the final value is 0. This one represents a convergent exponential, the final value is 0. So without actually calculating a, b, c and d, I can see by inspection that the underlying components in this signal all converge to 0, so the final value will be 0. But let's now look at applying the final value theorem and see, does it give us the same answer? So here we go. I apply the final value theorem. The limit as s goes to 0, and you'll see I've taken the same transfer function as I had before, but critically, I've put an s in the numerator. So I've got 5s over s plus 1, s squared plus, oh, sorry, there's an s missing there. Let's put it in, plus s plus 4, times s plus 2. Now, if I let s go to 0, I get 5 times 0 in the numerator, and 1 times 4 times 2 in the denominator, and therefore I get 0 as expected. What about the next example? Now you'll notice there's a subtle difference between this slide and the previous slide, and the subtle difference is that this factor on the left is now just s. So when I take the um, partial fractions, I get a term a over s, this term here, and this term here. Now again, exactly as in the previous slide, this d over s plus 2 is a convergent exponential. The final value will be 0. This one here, with the s squared plus s plus 4 in the denominator, is a sinusoid times a convergent exponential. The final value is 0. But a over s is a step of magnitude a, so the final value is a. And therefore, I can see if I had this in partial fractions already, that the asymptotic value or the steady state has got to be a. Now, let's apply the final value theorem and see what it gives. So here we go. Again, we seem to have um, missed our s down here. Sorry about that. So we've got the limit as s goes to 0 of 5s over s 
times s squared plus s plus 4 times s plus 2. Now, what you can do here is you notice that in the numerator and the denominator, there's a factor s. So I can cancel those, those s's. And therefore, when I let s tend to 0, I get 5 over 4 times 2, which is a non-zero steady state. And indeed, you could show, I'm not going to do it here, that this must therefore be A. A couple of examples to try, just to check we know what we're doing. So use the final value theorem to find the final value of the signal with the following Laplace. And all I'm going to do is use the formula. No thinking, plug everything straight in. The limit as s goes to 0 of s times s plus 6 divided by s, s plus 2, s squared plus 3s plus 7. Now, what I should have said, um, and I forgot to do this, which is a bit naughty, is first you must check convergent. Are the underlying signals going to have an asymptotic value? Well, the s plus 2 clearly corresponds to a convergent exponential, and the s squared plus 3s plus 7 clearly co corresponds to um, a convergent exponential multiplied by a sinusoid. And therefore, I know that the underlying signal is convergent, so therefore I can apply the final value theorem. This is a check you must always remember to do. So, having written out the final value theorem, you'll now notice there's an s in the denominator, which cancels with an s in the numerator. And then, when I let s go to 0, I get left with 6 over 2 times 7. Hopefully you'll agree, this is very easy to do. One final example. Use the final value theorem to find the final value of the signal with the following Laplace. Now this is actually a trick question. It's checking whether the student really knows what they are doing. Because what I would expect a student to do is immediately to circle this s minus 4 and say g of s equals a over s minus 4 plus something else and clearly this corresponds to an a e to the 4t which is a divergent signal and so therefore there is no final value. So you write back to the examiner and you say this signal does not have a final value theorem, you cannot a final value, so you cannot use the final value theorem. A summary. Only exponentials with negative exponents or signals mot multiplied by exponentials with negative exponents converge to an asymptotic value. And this asymptotic value will be zero. Other signals do not have a steady state with one exception and that is constants or steps, which have a non-zero steady state. The final value theorem can be used to determine the steady state, but obviously only for signals that have a steady state. If a transform does not include a factor s in the denominator, and assuming it does have an asymptotic value, then that final value will be zero.